Good evening and welcome to you all tonight. Welcome to the Hive Buddy Bee Club. Uh, our little bee club here is a free online group that can be found at members.hivebuddy.com and online at these club meetings that we have once a month. Uh, I guess, Carmel, at these sessions, we discuss some news, current issues, what's been going on in the beekeeping space. Um, you normally give us a little bit about what's happening seasonally, which is which is great, especially relevant for probably with a thought with a bit more of relevance for the southeast of the country, but um, certainly we uh, we don't, try not to ignore other people um, from other areas. But we also like to get into a little bit about um, dig dig a little bit deeper into something that's caught our interest over the last few months. Um, for those that are that are new to here, which I think there's only a few, uh, I'm Simon Mildren, and my dear co-host is Carmel Gertson. Welcome, Carmel. Welcome, Simon. Welcome, everybody else. It's absolutely awesome to um, have such a great live group with us tonight. But um, without further ado, I think we should uh, just get cracking right into it. And just a, just a reminder to those that are here, if you were, weren't able to watch the last session or you're new to this group, you can go back and watch the previous ones. And whilst there might be a little bit of that local um, or some seasonal element, uh, well, it's only going to be a month old, isn't it? But we talk about a whole lot of other things. And I wrote a few notes down just really quickly on what we discussed last month, Carmel, as a bit of a quick recap and a reminder. We yeah, talked a bit about, answer. remember we talked about Manuka and we talked about that crazy situation with how Coles has been locking up Manuka in plastic cabinets to stop people stealing 30 something dollar jar, tubs of honey. We talked about that wonderful initiative up in Newcastle where they're creating a, a, a native pollinator friendly space, which is obviously relevant given the Varroa situation up there. Um, it got us onto the conversation about pollen shortages in Fiji. Yes. And we banged on a while about Fiji and beekeeping and then the issues that they have there. And do you remember the thing that caught my interest the most? was how they have pollen shortage because it rains so heavy, so much, and it just washes the pollen away. Oh, so that happens all the time as a regular thing? Because it's, 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 it's completely regular and normal, but when it's a really, really wet year, it's worse. And oh. I think that's, what, that's, that's sort of what was happening there. Um, yeah. You gave us a bit of a deep dive on the practicalities of rendering wax, and it's yeah. because of that session that you did then that I've got some inspiration to talk to everyone tonight about beeswax in general. So I'm looking forward to talking about what I've learnt in that space a bit later on. We talked about some news out of Western Australia. We talked about El Nino and what might it mean for us, although throw your hands up in the air, I don't really know to tell you the truth. And we finished up talking about earthquakes. Remember that? Yes, because we just had one again. <laughs> That's right. The most Is it the most earthquakes we've had in Victoria in a long time, I reckon? I don't know, but it's, it's a bit crazy, to be yeah. totally honest. But anyway, well, that's just a quick reminder. You can go and find that on the Hive Buddy community YouTube page, and you can also find it in the Hive Buddy community online. So let's get on to some a few things that has caught uh, my my attention just the last few weeks, Carmel. Uh, the very first one, just the newsworthiness sort of ideas. The first one was we need a like a news, we need like a bump, 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 bump. Oh, we do, we do. <laughs> right. You know what? We'd we'd try and press we'd try and press something and make something happen, and we'd close the recording down or something it would just probably end up being a disaster so maybe maybe we'll just go with your version like you just did now <laughs> all right i'm happy to sing it each time that's fine uh, so the first one was there's a few articles getting around this last couple of weeks about quite a lot of the the uh beekeepers in new south wales remain confident about varroa being beaten have you noticed a bit of that yes i have actually yes um, but like naturally, when you read an article like that, for every one that I read like that, I feel like I see something of the opposing opinion. <laughs> yes, the, the, it, it, it is sort of um, dividing the country um, and it doesn't really matter what side of the fence you're on. It is what it is. But it's been interesting to watch um, everything that develops and unfolds. That's for sure. Yeah, that's exactly it. Well, let's see. Let's see what comes of that. It's sort of... Uh, a little bit touch and go. Uh, we have followed it a little bit more in some of our other meetups. We're sort of just suggesting people go and check out their local, their state-based resources there if they want to learn more. I, guess, I, wanted... I guess from, you know, past stuff, just really quickly, because, um, you know, it, it, it is horrible that they're killing so many bees and I can understand the camp of people that don't want that to happen. 
Um, but they have stopped Jacob's, um, the Jacob Sony one up in yeah. Townsville and Cairns right. before. And that actually took three years before they could officially say that we've gotten rid of them. Um, obviously, they didn't go to such big measures. I, I guess because New South Wales is just so much more populated, the impact has been better. I think we've got a really large spread of an area too this time. So I think there's going to be, whilst, whilst I think what you're saying is in, is relevant, um, when you've got such a wider expanse of area impacted, it just, if, if it can be contained, it just might take five years instead of three. Yeah. Who so knows? I, when... know, I guess they all have protocols and things that they have to set in place. Having worked at big events before, I know the logistics and the discussions and stuff that takes place when you're coordinating things like that and yep. you know they'll already have a plan in place that if it's if it doesn't work at some point they'll pull the pin and yeah that's it you know, they'll there'll be contingencies and they'll be taking data and measuring it all and regardless of whether we agree with it or not this is what's happening hey while we're on such a glum topic um because it's not not and i promise then to uh pivot back to something more more positive which i've got some great ones um, also news out of the US, each year they tell us about their number of colony losses over the 12 month period up to 1st of April. Yeah. Um, did you catch that news this last week because it came out? I saw I saw the article come across my eye and I went, oh, I should read that. Well, let me fill you in. Right. More than well, happy to fill you in. So it's really most really people here have probably already noticed it somewhere, but um, they're saying that 48% of colonies were lost in the last uh, 12 months up to April 1st and you go well 48% is a staggering number like let's be like okay. that's one in that's half it's one of every two colonies die and do not survive through through the through the course of the year but to give that some context last year the year before was um was yeah so we've had 48% um it's up from the previous year's loss of 39% so that's wow. quite a bit more the 12 year average also being 39 Point six percent, yeah. Um, but it's not as high as 2020, 21, which was just over fifty percent, so fifty point eight percent mortality rate. So forty eight is still a staggering number, and I think a long way from what sort of losses we have here. Yeah. Um, but when you think that they're used to the idea of forty percent anyway, yeah. well, if you worked around that, then it's not really too different. But What's what's your mind on that one, Carmel? What's so different about what they do there to what we do here? Um, well, what they do there that we don't have here is we don't have, well, you know, we're working on it. We don't have <laughs> Varroa. <laughs> um, and we don't have, and even if we do end up having Varroa, it doesn't have the deformed wing virus vector, the ones that landed here in Australia. Yes. don't have that disease with them so um so the colony collapse disorder as far as that side of things you know wouldn't happen yep. um i don't know if it's they uh, also, true they have more severe temperatures there you know that, that there are areas that get snowed in so winter can be a lot harsher yeah um, yep. for some of the hives um but like I it was years ago now, I was on a bee tour with a bee club and we went and visited a commercial beekeeper. So you got to remember you've got hobby beekeeping and you've got commercial beekeeping. And in hobby beekeeping, generally you don't have losses of 40 to 50% unless you're really not doing something right with your hive. Um, but commercial beekeeping is a completely different thing. And those bees are their livestock they work really hard yeah. so they get put on the back of trucks like hundreds or thousands of hives on the back of a truck which are driven for hours on end on semi-trailers so there's a lot of stress to the bees um when you've got that many hives in an area together there's much more diseases that can be spread around much more competition for food and starvation and that sort of thing. Yep, yep. And then, as I said over there, they've got the the varroa mites or the colony collapse disorder. They're gonna they they have to treat their hives with yep. some of the treatments. If you get the if you get the mixture wrong, you're not gonna just knock out your varroa. You're gonna knock out your bees as well. So yep. there's probably lots of different things that go into you know some of it would be weather or seasonal related. Some of it would be environmental. 
Um, and I think I think the land use practices. Land use practices as well. Yeah. Um, you know. Monocropping farming from horizon to horizon. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of things there. Um, side this, note, I'll oh, go on. Sorry, this commercial beekeeper. Um, when we were there, it wasn't bee, but one of the audience very bravely asked because he's a migrationary beekeeper, and they he was a third generation, so they'd been doing this for years. Um, and one of the audience said, "Can you tell me honestly how many hives do you lose every year?" And he goes, we regularly, we replace about a third of our hives every year. And that was regular practice. Sure. And that's here sure. in Australia without, yep. you know. But like I said, commercial beekeeping is completely different to hobby beekeeping. Yep. They're two different worlds. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Like that's just, it's just worth being aware of that and just think it through. And um, it, we're, we're probably fortunate in the small scale beekeeping space that most of what we do, we're surrounded by lots of, beautiful properties, a mosaic of urban environments, um, yeah. a whole heap of different variety. And I think that overcomes a lot of the issues that, that happen in that space. Yeah. And while I just bring a nice little positive upbeat finish to that one, I want to tell you about something really awesome that's happening out of Tasmania. Um, so came across my news feed, three young Tasmanians will represent Australia at an international gathering of young apiarists. Oof tongue twister, in Slovenia next month. And Where's how Slovenia? Did, oh, well, let, I will be happily, oh, well, because of this news story, I'm going to deep dive on Slovenia a little bit later. So hold oh, on. I can't wait to tell you more. But um, young Ruben, 16 years old, and 14-year-old Audrey and Lilith from down there in Tassie are on their way to a five-day event in Slovenia. And they're the only Aussies representing, being represented over there. And they get tested on their knowledge and skill, um, which I think is kind of, and this is re directly related to beekeeping. Um, and the usual story came about with one of the, with Ruben, how he started beekeeping was just always looking across the paddock at his neighbor's place and seeing the bees there. And one day before he knew it, he had, the neighbor gave him some bees because of that interest. So it's, it's that classic story of just seeing what's going on. And before you know it, another beekeeper is, pass that on to someone else. And this this 16 year old Ruben is already selling his, his honey and other beeswax related products and doing a really good job. But they had to do this amazing process and I, I wish I knew more, but um, maybe I'll find that out one day. But the three of them participated in like a 14 stage competition down in Tassie. It was an Australian competition where they had to- uh, and, Yeah, I don't know what 14 stages. I can't even think of, I've done 14 stages of anything. Um, but uh, they go through quest general knowledge and equipment identification to pest and disease analysis and uh, the ability to identify different honeys, um, their skills at building frames and boxes and all these things. And I tell you what, based off what I've read, they probably have more competence and capability than most of us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to offend someone who's listening. No one's left yet, but... Um, <laughs> Um, they probably they're probably right onto it, but it made me really think. And um, oh, look, credit where credit's due. Um, there's a beekeeper down there in Tassie called Anita Long. I've seen her name pop up before. So she's uh, she formed the Tasmanian Junior Beekeepers Group, which I've seen. I reckon I've seen that on the socials before. Yes. Um, and she's she's like, well, here in Australia, young beekeepers are out there, but they're not well connected. And she's been part of this group over there that's brought this about. So I love the idea about. I don't hear it often a lot, Carmel, about how young beekeepers get involved and what's being done for them. Well, can I share a little project that I'm working on? Um, we need more of this. So, yeah, what's going down? Because they're our future generations, right? You know, we're not all going to live forever and, and we need more beekeepers coming along to the bee clubs as the years go on. So um, some of you may be aware, as well as my involvement here on Hive Buddy, I'm also now the president of the Werribeeks Bee Club, which is, you know, helps to service the western suburbs of Melbourne and Werribee and Tarnate, Hoppers Crossing, Wyndham, all the right. Um, so the, our bee club is at a community centre and we have an apiary um, at, as part of the community centre. They've got a community shed, which has... Um, a garden and a woodworking room and a clay room and a metalworking room. And so there's community activities and our apiaries at the back of that. So we're becoming part of this community shared family. Mm, and right. um, the community centre was 
got got granted a grant, <laughs> uh, received a grant, um, but it was during COVID and the money never got used. Um, and they they went back to the council and the council said, well, we'd really still like you to use it. So can you find something to put this money towards? Um, so as I said, we've, we've just planted the seed. It, it, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're working on the plan of it at the moment. So it was for children and it was for bicycles. Oh. So I did a bit of a creative brainstorm like I do. And mobile be mobile beehives. No, not I wasn't <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, no, what we're gonna do, we're gonna have a kids in a in rotation groups. So we'll we'll engage the garden and the, they can make insect hotels and right. So each kid will rotate, but one of the activities I'm going to create oh and they've got a bicycle repair little workshop at this community uh, as well we're going to build a bike that hmm. has some extra pulleys on it and we're going to attach it to an extractor yes so the kids can get on the bike get and they, out. Can, they can spin the honey out on the bike so it's still for kids and they're learning about bees and it still incorporates bikes and so the community oh. management they were very impressed with my idea so we're that uh, is that is some next level uh engagement with people isn't it yeah, it'll be fun <laughs> and they'll learn. And so, yes, yeah, so we're just putting it all together at the moment to figure out that. I wonder if you're the first to do that because beekeepers are a fairly innov an in innovative bunch and there's know. some weird and wacky things that have happened out there. So whilst it seems like a brand new thought to me, I could imagine someone saying, oh, yeah, we did that. <laughs> there's actually a company in Melbourne and they're called Smoothie Bikes. Mm. And so they've got a... A, a mix master and so you can make yourself a oh yes a, a smoothie through the smooth yeah so there's actually a, a company or two already in melbourne that do that and i was at a festival this is when i was a face painter years ago oh yes <laughs> um and they had the smoothie, <laughs> they had the smoothie bikes there and so that was where i got i thought surely if they can do it with a with a blender <laughs> i'm sure we can make it work with a with a rotary um extractor that's madness. Well, I love it. That's yeah, absolutely okay. crazy. Well, yep. keep us keep the club keep the club here updated. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to see more how that goes over time. <laughs> well, why don't you um give us a bit of an update with what's happening with uh, the bees around Southeast Australia and whatever you've noticed locally? What's happening? Well, I mean, yes. Yeah, so we are um well. There's there's again two different parts to this. You've got hobby beekeepers. Um, and especially down here south, obviously, I know more about Victoria and the southern states than up north because they really don't get a break. I love that we kind of get a break. Well, I mean, I love beekeeping, but, you know, it's like you can focus your attention on frames and wax and stuff like that. Um, so, but the commercial beekeepers, um, they are getting ready for pollination, almond pollination. It's the first event that starts off the whole pollination season and then yep. they do their rounds from there. So um, I've, I've heard a bit of chatter about feeding and do I need to feed the bees and, and that sort of thing. And, and um, I guess if, you know, if you prepared your hive properly and you, you're in a colder state, um, and you've packed them down, they should be okay. And, and I'll go into more depth about how you test for that later. <clears throat> but those in pollination, um, especially the ones here in Victoria and South Australia, they'll be taking them up um, up near the Murray, up near the border there. So, and yep. obviously we've probably still got border issues. Um, I'm not 100% up to date with passes and interstate and movement from New South Wales and all of that kind of thing. But it's slightly warmer up north, yep. um, up near the border, and they will actually be feeding their bees um, on syrup because it's warmer. They can do that up there to stimulate the queen to lay, so that they've got more babies. Yep. So that and they'll be they'll be building up the hives to make them stronger. So, I guess for the commercial guys, some of them are kind of manipulating that natural cycle a bit. Um, either that if they're not feeding them though we look there might be some flows around I know there's a few iron barks and stuff in flowers so you know the beekeepers all have their special spots that yep. they go um so that's they'll be expanding their um their hives getting ready for pollination which starts at the end of July so it's only about four weeks and four or five weeks away 
I wonder what will be the seasonal. Um, I'm not really aware of it this year. I feel like we've had a cold, really cold winter so far. It's um, been there's very a lot cold. of there's a lot yeah. of snow snow on the ground in the high country, which is normally what I look at and yeah. judge my how cold has it been. Yeah. Um, and what that then means to the timing of like the the spring bud burst for the almond plants trees. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of where if we're ahead or behind with what is normal. Yeah. I don't so know. We've, I had, don't... we've had some cold days, but we've had some really cold nights as well. And that normally happens when there's no cloud cover. Of course, yep. It's the cloud cover that keeps the heat in often. So I'm, you know, with things getting a bit drier supposedly now, yep. um, it will be interesting to see. And I'm like, I'm not going to predict anything because I, you know, um, I'm not an expert weather person, but, um, you know, it, it has been very cold and um, bees obviously cluster when um, it's it's 10 degrees or less. So they stop flying and they focus all their attention on keeping the hive warm and keeping yep. each other warm. And what they do is the queen will be in the middle and then the the hive itself is like a rotating ball. So the bees on the centre, they'll come out to the outside and the bees on the in, outside will go into the centre. So they stay in a cluster but they rotate and so they take turns because um, keeping warm takes a lot of energy and so they are not going to live for as long if they wear themselves out. So Penguins. it's about giving each other a break. And did you know that the bees actually, it's like they dislocate their shoulders. What? They, yeah, they, they, un, they unhook their wing mechanisms. And so they, 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 they nah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they actually, it's like they're flying, but their wings are not moving. So they're shivering their body. It's like they're flapping without their, because oh. they're engaged. Wings don't move, but the rest of their body yeah, would move creating, like it normally. They're creating friction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the first time I've ever heard that. That's wacky. Yeah, yeah. So that's how they generate more heat. But, of course, that takes a lot of energy. And so mm. they also then have to go. And, and if you've removed your queen excluder, and then they can actually cluster up where the honey is. Yep, and, yep. But if, if you've left your queen excluder in, then a few of the bees have to go up there to get honey because they don't want to leave the cluster for the queen to keep her warm. Yeah. So I've also noticed that my honey is candying really quickly at the moment. Ooh, okay. Um, so the the optimal temperature, if you don't want honey to candy, either freeze it, take it below zero. Yep. Or you want to keep it at between 25 and 30 degrees. So you're talking about your honey that's stored in your cupboard, shed, garage, bedroom, wherever you store your honey at home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so anything between, I think it's about, uh, I think it's about between 10 and 14 degrees Celsius. That's the perfect candying. Uh, and yep. Really, really quickly. But if you And that's it, Melbourne. <laughs> that's Melbourne at this time of year. That's yeah. south of everything yes. south of the divide yes. at this it's time of year. One of the joys of living in the southern states, yes. So um, I've noticed that um, the bees are, the, the honey's candying really quickly. Um, but the bees, you know, they can eat that. And and when you come to feed your bees, um, people go, what do I feed them this time of year? As I said, if you've prepared your hive properly, they should have plenty on board. Yep. And the way you can observe that, and I went around just the other day and did it to my own hives, and my hives are chockers. They've actually yep. been bringing honey in. So Good. they're mine where I am are, are very heavy. And, and like I'm planning going, if they're very heavy and they don't use this honey, then I need to create space for them early at the start of spring. Otherwise, I'm going to have swarming on my hands. And what ah. I do is I go around, let's say, where's my cup? That's that's the hive there. And I just I just come from the base and I give it a, just a little a little tilt, a little yep. heft, and I can feel I can feel the weight of the hive. And so, like I said, mine are, are they've actually put on more honey since I packed them down, which is it's for me that's you know really good. But like I yep. said, I have to prepare for swarming. If you do that and the hive's really light, 
then they've used up whatever you left for them. So whether the hive was weak or whether it was a new hive or whether you didn't have a flow or whether you were over greedy and you just took too much honey, um, yep. the hive's feeling light and that's when I would be going, okay, I need to feed them. Yep. Um, so what would you feed them? I would be feeding them either fondant and yep. fondant is a mixture of icing sugar and glucose. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, again, sorry, I'm talking more about the southern states where we have a true winter. Up north, you can still feed them sugar syrup. Yep. Uh, whether I it thought be so. One be to stimulate the queen, or whether it's a two part sugar to one part water, which is a bit thicker, that yep. they put into the comb as stores. So they they build up the honey supply with that. Yep. But down south here. You either want to feed them fondant, um, and obviously if you've got agressy, you can knead a bit of the agressy into yep. the fondant. So the fondant with the glucose, it's it stays kind of pliable. It's like royal icing. So it's it's solid. It's like Play-Doh kind sure. of. Sure, sure, oh, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, what I, I'm dying to know, yeah. like I'm sure you're about to get to this, sorry, but um, like I don't know how much to put on a beehive. Like I think... Obviously, that this is a little bit variable, but how much fondant are you giving the bees on an occasion? Feel free to keep talking about what you're doing, but I just know that am I putting in just a little bit? Do I need to put a lot? I don't know where that sits. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, look, to be honest, I've never actually fed with fondant, so I don't know. Yep, yep. Um, it's very rare that I've ever had to feed any of my hives because I'm never greedy at the end of the season. Yeah, yep. Um, I would imagine, and... And, of course, if you need to feed the bees, and, again, temperature-wise, I'm talking more down south here, if it's like if it, if your hive's starving, then you need to open up the hive and put something in there, but you want to be quick. And yep. um, so as a desperate measure, you can even put just dry sugar. Yep. Oh, yes, yeah, yep, definitely yeah, done that. Noel saying he's got iron bark in flow. I knew there was some iron bark around. Um, so you can lift the lid off. Put some newspaper and put dry sugar, even if it's yep. half a kilo or a kilo, um, and then put the lid back on. So you're not taking out any frames. You can already feel from the hive that it's light in weight anyway. Yep. Yep. And there'll be enough um, condensation and moisture that the bees will be able to come and eat that dry sugar. Yep. Um, with the fondant, I again, I would put half a kilo and then go back in three days. I mean. Check it out. During the season when you've got a bigger hive, they'll go through they'll go through two liters of sugar syrup in two or three days. Yep. But that's a that's springtime and growing and they're building wax and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I would put in half a kilo and then and check in yep. a couple of days and see. If they don't want it, they won't touch it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um and then of course not only do they need um, energy, um, if there's a few babies there, they will need a bit of pollen. And so there's pollen patties, which you normally feed either coming into autumn or going into spring. They shouldn't yep. need – some queens are not even laying this time of year. Um, so um, oh, sorry, I'm just reading the comments. The orientation flights are in Hopper's Crossing, so that's down in um, west of Melbourne, yeah, western suburbs of Melbourne. And you will still get orientation flights. Um, the nursing bees need to go out for a toilet every now and again. There are some queens still laying, especially if you've got a flow on, but some are not. Yep. So the only thing you've got to watch with pollen paddies or pollen feeding is small hive beetle. So, again, you're better right. off feeding a small amount and then checking it. And so as, as long as it's, you know, if you're desperate, 14, 15 degrees, you're taking the lid off, you're putting something on the top and you're putting the lid back on. You're so like 15, 15 seconds sort of at the most. Yeah. It'll like, yeah, it'll probably take you longer to light the smoker than it will to <laughs> to do the yeah. job on it. Yeah. So just be really quick. Don't, no, we're not looking. We're not lifting frames. We're not trying to crack crack it open to see anything further down just you're there for one purpose only yep. put it in put the lid on leave 
And I'll tell you, it, it, the the starvation or the, the drop in food, if you've got no flow on, we are lucky in the suburbs because there's generally something around. But I'll tell you a little story. Um, there were three of us, Hawken, another beekeeper and myself. We sent a whole lot of hives up to the almonds about four years ago now, I think, from memory. And, of course, I had prepared the hives and had sent up them with honey on board because almonds give great pollen, but they don't give any nectar or sure. really hardly any nectar. So you send them up with ne with honey on board to get them through. Yep. <clears throat> and that particular year, we had some very, very, it was like two or three days where the maximum temperature during the day was like nine degrees. And I remember it, it was bitterly cold. Mm. And what they do at the almond pollination is they'll go through and they'll check every second hive or a few hives because you get paid on the number of, like if you've got nine frames of bees or seven frames of bees, or, and if you're on a nine-frame farm and you've only got six frames of bees, you won't get paid for that hive. Yeah, sure. So they go through and they check. And so when they were checking our hives, our numbers were fine but they had no food on board and they said, your hives are starving. You're going to need to feed them. And they very kindly, they put newspaper and they sprinkled sugar on the top. And me, myself and this other beekeeper, we made up 120 litres of two to one syrup, mm, yeah, buckets, yeah. buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of the stuff and put um, Agrisy in it as well. And then yep. Hawken had to do another drive. And that's like a five hour drive. That's so a big drive. Five hour drive. <laughs> He's feeding all of the bees. But it happened so quickly because they all went up there with, because yeah, they yeah. were there for three weeks. That was like a week and a half. And they had, they chewed through all of their food that was there. Crikey. Well, that's just what happens, though, isn't it? Yeah. That's just what happens. So that's what I'm saying. Every week or every couple of weeks, go out. And if you if you're in a place where it's too cold to open your hive, at least feel the weight of it. Feel yep. the weight of the hive, and watch the front door. You know, if if it's a sunny day and there's no bees, well, what's going on? What's going on? Or if it's freezing cold and there's a whole bunch of bees hanging out outside and they're not fitting, like or something, you know, maybe they're overrun with hive. What there's some what's going on? So. Yep. Yeah. A good to a good one is to really have a good smell close up to the to the hive entrance as well. Yes. Um, and if you're smelling anything that's a little bit off, um, maybe there's too much moisture in there, maybe they're too cold, maybe there's some disease, um, and it might make you want to feed them and give them something to boost their capability. What do you got there? Any, any hive with this is this is a hive base. <laughs> any sure. this is the entrance of the hive. Any of you that have solid bases, make sure that your entrance is tilted down and the back's tilted up. Yeah, because of course. Because if you do get a lot of condensation, at least it's going to come out the front door. If you've got if you've got it tilted the other way and it and it's getting too wet inside, all of that moisture is going to gather inside the the back of the hive as well. So. Um, yep. I have ventilated bases, but yeah, if any of you have solid bases, then. Um... Um, and the other thing too is what's certainly been an impact for me is when I've in winter time, if I've not had a good cover on the top of the the frames at the top, just a bit of vinyl or whatever it is, that moisture, that condensation that hits gets on the top of the hive because obviously yep. it's the cold cold surface, dropping and then running through those frames of brood will kill a hive. Yes. Um, so if it hits they that mat drown. and then runs they can out, they brown no. in their own rain. Basically. But it's cold. It's just it's just bitterly cold, and bees yeah. won't survive through that. They just won't. Love your comment, Andrew. Andrew's just made a comment of uh, how he loves the bees coming out to the front door uh, when you do lift them up to see how it's going, and they say, "Oh, yeah. what's going on here?" And that's exactly what you you know. That's good. And that's that means what they're, you want. Yeah. <laughs> they're not far from the entrance. They're yeah. alert. They're just conscious. They're just seeing seeing what's happening here. Yeah, I have been agree. known to put my ear up against the hive as well. So that doesn't shock me at all, coming from you, Carmel. <laughs> well, because sometimes it's just like, is there anyone in there still? You know, and it's like, yep, and you yep. listen, and you hear them. You can hear them inside us. Yeah. 
So like, all right, you... they're in there, they're alive. It's okay, I'll come back another day. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Now, did you happen to have anything else that's happening in the apiary or that you think is a good update for people at the moment or you sort of? No, I think I've pretty much covered it. You're like, just observe your hive. Um, like, it, you know, hopefully you won't have to feed them if you've prepared them properly. And, and I think that feeling the weight of it's the main thing. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, and we've got, I mean, like I said, sorry, Northern people, you guys keep just keep going. But Well, know, it's fascinating how it works up there, isn't it, with that uh, more, uh, we have that seasonal variability that's so much more serious and that's just what we have to work with and up uh, that way with that more consistent temperatures. Uh, there's yeah. a, They've got the ability to run brood solidly. I mean, we do too. You could probably have brood all year round down here and an active queen, but up there it's a properly active queen. <laughs> Year Someone round. was saying they've still got drones. Michelle, Michelle's still got drones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so that's a little yeah. bit surprising, but I suppose not impossible. Well, if it's a strong hive and there's plenty of food around, they will keep a few drones. That's a really good sign that it's a healthy hive and it's in a, and it's happy. It's in a, you know, good place with plenty of food. Now, I'd love to tell you about a few other things that I've come across, Carmel, and I'm giving you a choice at the moment. Do you want option A, which is in my right hand, or option B, which is in my left hand, first? I want, oh, first. Yeah, you get uh, both. You can have both. Uh, B, B, B's wax it is. So you inspired me last session, um, yeah, yeah. and I adjusted my B's wax rendering ways, which is a good oh, thing. Yeah. Um, I just simplified it, to be honest. I think I was overcomplicating a few things, but it made me go, well, I've often looked into honey, I've looked into the bees i've looked into pollen and nectar and all these things yeah. um but i've never really paid a lot of attention to beeswax to be honest and do you know what like i get big lumps of beeswax at the end of every season and i don't do anything with them and they sit in the cupboard and i'm probably missing out on an opportunity there but that's that's fine but i thought you know what there's a i need to know more so i'm going to share this link later on hive buddy um but i found this wonderful document which is about 12 years old or 14 years old now, which has just got a whole heap of info. I'm going to share some of that with you. Yeah, um, right. And if you, yeah, and if you think of it, stuff. oh, look, but first up, I just wanted to go back on a bit of the history of beeswax. Yeah. And I don't know if you've come across this sort of thing before, but I do recall from maybe when I was at primary school learning about, or high school or whatever it was that you learn about Egyptians and what, you know, Egyptology, that they were using beeswax with embalming, and you know, for mummification of pharaohs and all of that sort of thing, many thousands of you know, fifteen thousand years ago, sort of thing, um, and um, like that whole wrapping of the the mummies was all sort of kept together with beeswax. Okay. I remembered that. Um, yeah, and that that wasn't just happening in Egypt; that was happening in Persia as well to embalm the dead. And it was actually from the Persians that the word. Um, let me read this. The word mummy is derived from the Persian word meaning wax. So there's that link there between the two that I'd never really heard of before. That was completely new to me. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I bet you would, John. I just saw your message there, mate. And I remember, too, a story from, and I don't know if it was from a religious studies thing or a um, mythological, you know, what you go through in school, I can't remember, it's been a while. And it's, it talks about the ancient Greek legends of the Athenians. The architect Daedalus is rem remembered because he and his son Icarus, and it was Icarus that triggered in my memory, that they were trying to get off the island of Crete and they made themselves wings of bird feathers fastened to their body with beeswax. Do you remember the rest? Does this story ring a bell to you? Vaguely. And they left, I think they jumped off this thing and started flying away from Crete and they flew too high and got too close to the sun. The sun and it, do you remember it now? And it melted the beeswax yes. and they fell into the Aegean Sea and drowned. I do and his, remember that story. But his father flew a bit lower and, and made it safely to Athens. So, oh, well, survival of the fittest, I guess you could say that is. <laughs> I guess so. Oh, Andrew, you beeswax, the gaffer tape before they invented gaffer tape. Um, absolutely a thing, it seems to be. 
Um, there's so many, there's so many uses for it, and like it's all been super, most of the uses now have been superseded with something more modern, just like you've said. Um, but do you know what's really interesting is how so many of us that are here right now listening and talking, how we would use or talk about honey and bee products giving us health benefits. So it's been for thousands of years that the Chinese have used beeswax for its health benefits, and. Wow. Um, say that what's that Ow. oh look um there's lots of different ways a lot of them there's there's one that i didn't quite follow other than this it's a there's like skin treatment by melting wax and putting it onto your skin and it can help heal injuries and wounds and that sits in the realm of current processes too because i know they use medicinal honeys for treatment of burns so i thought yeah there's a link there somewhere i don't necessarily know the full link but um, certainly skin conditions has been a really big one um, that we've, we've already mentioned. Um, really good for as a health food for dieting. And I don't sort of know the true value there. It doesn't really go into the detail I'd like. But I'm guessing if you're chewing that, there's a few things that are happening. Firstly, there'll be nutritional benefit. I mean, beeswax goes straight through and out the other end. I think we all know that. <laughs> but there'll be nutritional benefits that are just part of, that are carried in the beeswax from pollen and honey and what all these wonderful products that come from the bees, um, you would you would take those on as you consume the actual beeswax. And just like chewing gum, chewing normal like gum that you buy from the supermarket now, it helps you with appetite and helps you with digestion. I think that was the, the same thing that was happening then. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I also learnt, Carmel, where are we here? So candles, of beeswax, which were already used by the ancient Egyptians and, and the Greeks. Um, it was introduced to churches since the beginning of Christianity in Europe. And since like a couple of thousand years ago, it was required by the Roman Catholic Church that only beeswax candles should be used in their church. And that law is still valid to this day. And that's what I thought was the interesting bit. Um, however, they've sort of got a bit relaxed on it and they're like, ah, oh, look, yep. As long as there's some beeswax in there, chuck your paraffin in there as well or whatever else they use. So that's still a bit of a thing. So there's a lot of quirky little things that comes with beeswax. And the obviously there's... Your candles are amazing. In fact, I've got a video I can share with you all. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> yeah. Um, the, and this is from Mexico, actually. Oh. Yeah. I was, wasn't but... expecting you to say that. <laughs> yeah, from Mexico. So let me just grab the link. Um, and I will also put it in Hive Buddy, but for any of you that would like to have a look. And this is a 300-year-old tradition, um, but, again, it, it was associated with ceremonies and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and oh, thank you, yep. Yeah, and it's it, it's amazing, the work. But in this video, they actually show you how they sun-bleached the yellow wax to make it white so then they could add other colours to it. And these oh, yeah. candles, some of them are like a metre tall. And then she makes these wax flowers and stuff to decorate them. And, and they were. They were used in churches and ceremonies and weddings. And, like, there's a – it's an amazing, amazing tradition. Huh. Oh, yeah. so you've you've posted that link there. I'll make sure that link gets put in Hive Buddy later as well. And yeah, cool. um, we, sh we share that through, through there as well. Um. <clears throat> I was just going to see if there was a few other things. Oh, I was talking in there actually about like the origins or of like what the theories were about the origin of where does beeswax actually come from? And yeah. it's it's actually a fairly recent study in terms of understanding where the beeswax actually is generated from. Um, we can be all smart and clever that we know that the bees create it themselves now, but back in Greek yeah, times... Yeah, where did they used to think? Oh, like like we're talking 340-odd BC, that they thought that the beeswax actually originated, on, like it's all fairly practical, but originated on the flowers and they must collect it and bring it back. Oh, okay. So if you think about that, there wasn't any quirky like stories that it came from the gods and was struck down, you know, off the, off the mountain, right, nothing like that. <laughs> but but they certainly thought that it was must, must come from the flowers. And then as time went on, they thought, well... It's prepared by the bees from pollen. So in the 1600s, they thought it's the it's the pollen providing that value, and it wasn't until late in the in the 17th century that 
it was observed that the, the wax scales, you know, when you've probably seen bees creating or um, oozing out their wax, rendering their own wax, whatever you want to call that. And yeah. they were noticing the wax scales that form on the abdomen. Yeah, and that's right. when they knew that there's something happening on there. Then it was in the 1800s, 1744 to be precise, a German scientist, um, he actually reported that it's produced, that the bees themselves produce the wax. And then it's obviously evolved a bit since then to our, which is essentially our, remains our current understanding. But yeah, yeah so that's, it's that's an evolved. Oil. Wax is an oil. Yeah. It falls in the category of fats and oils. Um, and so, so they're secreting it out of there. It's amazing. And I've only got a few other wacky parts and I'll finish this up, but Madame Tussauds, the, um, the sculpture, the wax sculpture place in London and other places, I didn't realise, I just assumed that they'd be using some sort of synthetic thing, but they, they still to this day use three parts beeswax and one part of a harder wax. So I was actually really surprised by that. I thought that's kind of cool. That's a lot of beeswax. Yeah. Well, John, I mean, maybe it, you should approach them, John, to buy from them, mate. That's, that's, they might have some more. It doesn't start melting until it's like, I mean, it gets soft, but I think it's 65 degrees. It's, it's, it's quite a bit higher than a lot of the other more yeah, um, human-created human waxes. Um, and the last little thing, Carmel, I wanted to tell you about, it relates to food processing, Um just, just good to know, but beeswax is considered safe for human consumption, has been approved as an ingredient. Cool, that's okay. Like none of us here would worry about that, but that's a that's a truth. Um, we know it's inert in that it doesn't interact with our digestive system and just goes from one end to the other. That's lovely. Um, but the fascinating bit here there is the European Union have decided that it can be used as a food preservative, and the con and, but you can have the consumption of 1.29 kilos of beeswax per person per day. Yes, you heard me right. I didn't I didn't mis mistake that. Um, your consumption of 1,290 1, grams of beeswax per person per day are permitted. John, can you consume that much, mate? <laughs> so they've put a they've put a good upper limit there. I'd be I'd be baffled if I knew anyone who could get 100 grams down and keep it going. Um, and I don't want to even talk about what that might do to your system. I have no idea. Anyway, some thank you for last month planting that seed in my mind to go and look up a bit more about beeswax because it really got me um, intrigued. It's fascinating stuff, yeah. And like using them for wax seals, like the, they were the original wax seal on letters and envelopes and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, you could go forever, really. You could go bones. forever. Yep, absolutely. Yep, you can go forever. Yes. Oh, but as, um, and Andrew was saying here, yeah, we're careful not to make any therapeutic claims. Yes, we do have to be careful about that. But we have a lot of customers of our beeswax moisturiser that tell us that it heals damage and skin conditions. So yeah, yeah, there are there are definitely some um, some good things about beeswax. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, to to finish up now, I'm going to just uh, go through one last thing. You might remember Carmel. I said earlier, option <laughs> option B. Um, but before I, I'm going to. I'm going to tell you option B in just a second, but I just wanted to let the people on this call that are new to this group know that we do run online beekeeping mentorships, which I know that quite a number of our participants tonight are from those groups. And those groups meet twice a month through the sort of spring through to summer and then late summer through to autumn. Um, they meet twice a month and they have a mentor. I know you've been one of our mentors in the past, Carmel. At the moment, we've got Caroline and we've got Anna. And their mentorships will start up again in about in early September. And those groups will get going. Now they're online only mentorships and they gather together like this in small groups and really get personal. And I know that some of you that are on this call right now have had really great value from those. And if you want to learn more about that, please get in touch with us, but also get over to members.hivebuddy.com and just start to get a feel for the community that's online there. Option B though, Carmel. Option. I shared with you earlier a little bit about this competition that those three young beekeepers are going to in Slovenia. So I wanted to look into Slovenian 
beekeeping. Cool. You got any, anything you know about that? I know nothing. I don't even know where Slovenia is. Like, I mean, Europe. Oh, oh, hello. We're down the well, bottom. I've, Hi. I've, I've even <laughs> got that covered fire. for you because I had to go. I have an. Uh, rough idea where it is but i thought i better just help others out and make sure it's there so hopefully on your screen if you're looking now you'll see a little map of europe and yep. on europe there it is just on the eastern side of italy and sort of squished between italy and croatia and it's quite small and if you were to google map it you'd go and see that there's rolling hills lots of lots of hills to mountains and it's quite forested and lots of agricultural areas in between lots of little little small communities in between and simply stunning and one of the things that i Even learned compared over, to let's say victoria where we are oh good question i don't have a map that's really going to like bring the two together but it's, i would say it's smaller than victoria okay um more maybe a tasmania but that's really i could be out by a factor of a bit there but to give you some sort of perspective so what I ended up going off and doing, have you heard about Slovenian AZ beehives? Uh, I've heard the word AZ. As, but, as had uh, I, but never really gone away and appreciated a whole lot about it. I'm going to show you another picture. So check out this. This is sort of an old school version of it. So some people might not be able to... The bee house, right. Yes, yes, yes. So maybe for those that are listening, not watching, what do you sort of see there, Carmel? Um, so it looks like it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, thirty-six, seventy-two. So that looks like seventy-two highs, but they're all one box height, maybe. It's like a house with all high all it's like a hive apartment building. It is like a hive apartment building. I think that's a good. Now, I don't know. I don't know if what you've just done there is true in terms of seventy-two beehives. It might not be that. I don't know. Like um, there's seventy-two and, boxes there. Yeah, and whether they six, whether six. vertically, um, there's a little bit going on there between them. But um, we've got a little hut on the side of a hill, a very permanent looking hut. Well, Those that looks like a landing board between. Is that an? That looks like an entrance and a landing board. Down the front, it does too, doesn't it? Between each one, yeah. So maybe if we were to find out that they, uh, well, do you know what though? In between each, the front of each of those boxes also looks like a, a landing point. But look, this is an old school style. This is this is where this sort of beekeeping was founded, and they're very passionate in Slovenia about how they do this. And I can't remember what the um, it could have been five in every thousand people are beekeepers mm -hmm. over there. It might have been the number. I'm just it's it's similar to that anyway, which is a staggering number Seems when you like a lot. consider it. Yeah. yeah, but you see the you see sort of the geography of their land and it's fairly agricultural and you look at it and go, well, it's probably just lots of people probably have this set up at their home. They're definitely not big into the migratory beekeeping. They do this and they would have this and have it there and keep it there. Well that setup would be a bit hard to put on a trolley. <laughs> Well, it's funny. Um, I can't remember if the next picture show. No, it doesn't. But I'm going to go to the next picture anyway. But they do have some like trailer mounted versions. So, so they've managed oh. to make them mobile at the same time. Now, yeah. here, here's a lovely picture. Um, what, what do you see here, Carmel? A bit more of a close up, isn't well, it? Well, it, it's like a rainbow. It's so colourful. And you know what I love is, I mean, and, and it looks like they've got a one brood box and then an ideal above sure. that. And there's like three rows there. Um, but I love that they've got, like the bees would be able to find their front door so easily because every single one has different flower or leaf or drawing or it looks amazing. It's very it's, visual, it's isn't so, it? Very visual. Yep. So colourful. So a little bit about these Slovenian A to Z hives. So they've got similar dimensions to a Langstroth hive in that it's yep. still rectangular. And there's normally two to three levels. So this sort of, I agree with, it's hard to know whether they're full depth boxes that like we're used to here or whether they're a little bit less than that and they whether they follow perfectly to the Langstroth system. And are they um, eight frame or 10 frame? Um, and that's, that's something I don't necessarily have all the information about, but they certainly, um, they do have some space going up, but they don't have space to continue going up forever. Like we could, we could put box on box. That's not, they don't, keep their bees doing it that way 
Yeah, like, you know, it's not unheard of to have a three or four box, four, like, I've had a five box high hive once because there was so much sure. flow coming in. So that's not the approach that they would have, um, and I've just, I've just, I've just remembered. Is a ten frame box that they have, so they, they'd be quite wide. So it makes so me the think thing that with a ten frame box is a queen will lay quite comfortably in a ten. It's it's less likely she will run out of space. It's the yep. eight frames where you get into trouble with swarming, and that's yep. where running a double brood, I think, is a bit better. Um, so when you use yeah, an eight frame box. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, let me show you this next. Um, actually, I'm going to jump two forward and I'll come back to that lovely other picture I just showed oh. you. So this is, if you can imagine, this is the other side from of the beehive. That's how you um, access it. And it just, and so, so there's like a screen and then a latch and you could just slide it. It'd be like a drawer, two drawers, I guess. And you just like, slide it out. So there's like a, for, for those that can't see, there's like a hinged cupboard door on the back. So you don't access your bees from above like we're so often used to. That's not how it's done here. No and I can't lifting. help but think that this makes a lot of sense. No heavy lifting. No heavy lifting. The, if the heaviest thing you lifted was three kilos, that's about it. Yeah. Um, and then, yes, as you said, there's um, behind that, then there's a mesh screen that yeah. keeps the bees in on the other side. So you can actually open it up and have a look and get a sense of what your bees are like. Um, by peeking in there, you'd actually get a sense of the smell because it's yeah. open mesh like that. Yeah. And then you literally remove that mesh little panel there, whether that's hinged or not, I don't know in this picture, but then you can slide frames out to you mm. and you can inspect them that way. I wonder how, I mean, I need to dig into this more. How hard is it to slide those frames out? Like we know what propolis is like, are they heavily propolized and hard to loosen? And if they are hard to loosen, like, there's a different mechanism to make that work, I would think. But just such a fascinating way to keep bees. And they actually, there's a lot of pros that are worth mentioning in doing it this way. So if you can imagine here, there's a lot of thermal mass with so many beehives together like this. Yep. They actually don't suffer the same issues like our beehives do when they're individually positioned one next to the other. Here, they are literally next to each other sharing their warmth and their insulation in colder climates this would work and i also believe that um having talked to hawken who comes from sweden yep. in the, where you get snow um the whole season is much shorter so you yep. know they're snowed in for four months of the year like it's it's it, the That's winters it. are longer and and then the season it starts and it goes and then it stops and it's it's like a quite a shorter yep. so so they've got to stay warm and they've got to make the honey when the honey's happening and then it's done yep you know? yep and um, it is it's 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 considered to be less stressful on the bees because they're not having such a temperature differential because that area where the where where the hives back onto is usually sheltered and protect it and some of them actually back on to then another set of beehives on the other side facing the opposite direction yeah so you're so actually fully enclosed here in the heat of australia i don't know if that would be such a good thing i reckon it i reckon it's a maybe like that insulation factor is a thing you can always the, the bees will manage themselves yeah, um, quite well. Them. Well, yeah. I, and I don't know, in, in all honesty, Carmel, but um, they certainly say that there's a lot less stress because the temperature is much more balanced, yeah. um, lot, much less stress on them. Um, yeah. And because you can move remove one single frame at a time from the rear, that yeah. um, they're just simply not exposed to the ele elements. And because they're less stressed, they're not as aggressive. And I would imagine right. that you could, um, even if it was raining or showering a bit, if that was the back of the hives, it would be probably inside a house, like in a, you know, you'd be undercover as a beekeeper. If all you had was like a little canopy that was over you there, like what, that's a huge difference. Yeah. So um, I'm it pretty sure we're... a bit of the, you know, the robo hive. I was going to say exactly that. The, um, um, oh, I've forgotten their name right now off the top of my head, but the guys out of um, Israel and California who are making the shipping container that's like a modern day version of this, isn't it? It really is. And, I, and like it makes a huge amount of sense when you think about it. Like we're going back to that as a modern technique. Obviously, yeah. they've got sensor enablement and all these other things going on. But there's just so much advantage um, to a system like this. So um, 
they certainly comment about there's a lot less smoke used for inspections um, and that overall your footprint of your apiary is much reduced. Think about it. You can have so many more hives in such a smaller area. Um, anyway, I put it out there to you, Carmel, and to anyone listening that they should be starting to think about whether this is a thing. And if you know someone doing this out there here in Australia, I want to know what's going on. So please well, share, 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 share. We would, we would, because over there, the European honeybees are native. So they're a native bee to that area. So, and they encourage swarming. They love swarming. Swarming's a sign of abundance of bloody, yes, bloody, blood. Yep. So, here in Australia, where we've got the biosecurity code and the apiary code, yep. Um, and part of the apiary code is you can only have a certain number of hives on a certain size block of land. Yep. So this would be great though for maybe I don't well I don't know commercial beekeepers move their hives around. I don't know if this is a thing or not for here. I do not know, and I'd love to yeah. I'd love to know if anyone's trying it. There's only a couple of cons that are mentioned here about these AZ Slovenian hives. And obviously the effort to go to to establish it in the first place is quite significant. It's not simply, you can't simply add on. It's like you've got to have a fair setup to begin with. So that, that makes sense. I can understand that. Um, so that's a bit of a thing. Um, and the other one is that the original version of this, they but they were not compatible with Langstroth hives. They were, they were a different size. Um, so that's obviously a problem, um, like to go from one to the other. But you could, you could sort of set that up how you wanted. Yeah. I'd love to go back to that one photo I had before, Carmel. Let me just uh, make the old screen do that because I just thought this was simply beautiful. They take a, a lot of, um, they, they dedicate a lot of their passion to the visuals of their beehives. So have a look at those images. They're simply stunning, aren't they? Are they the landing boards? No, I, I don't know if they're the landing boards or they're just they're, the front, they're oh the no, front they're panel. Pieces. They're the front panel. Wow. I think they're wow. the front panel of the hives. And just the fact that they go to so much effort and in colour for their bees, I I really like it, Carmel. Yeah. It's, it's actually like I've not um, kept bees hugely passionately for a while. I've like kept them because I've wanted the products from them and I enjoy the hands-on here and there, but I've not got super passionate about it for a while. But I look at this and I go, well, this might be the next thing I have to have a, have a turn at. Well, Julie Kennedy has just said there's a company, Eight Frame Honey, do them in Australia. Ah, thank you. Because I'm dying to, I'm dying to know who's doing this, and um, yeah, hear what's going on. Yeah. Well, look at that, Carmel. I think. Okay, um, I loved it. What a what a journey we've been on I feel tonight. Like I've been to Slovenia now. <laughs> Well, I actually, we talked um, Fiji last month, this month Slovenia. Let's see where we go next month. Ooh, another country, yes. And, and speaking of which, uh, I'll put this out there more broadly later, but Tuesday the 25th of July, that will yep. be when we catch up with people next at the same time of 8pm Melbourne time, Tuesday the 25th of July. Well, that'll be right in the thick of winter then, won't it? Um, yeah, we'll be right. We'll be right. We'll have the... Hang on, we'll have the fire have the keeping fire. us warm. Yep. Yay, fire! <laughs> well, if, Michelle, you better come back if it's your birthday and um, join us next time. <laughs> Look, in saying that, Carmel, yep. always love having a chat with you. Always enjoy being here. Um, yes, thank you very fun. much. And for those that are listening, please please feel free to hang around. We'll have a brief chat at the end of this. But if you're uh, watching this after it, thank you for paying attention and we really hope you've enjoyed the evening. So you take it easy. See you next month, Carmel. No worries. See you next time. <laughs>